Hey there, everyone. We appreciate you staying with us here on CBS News. I'm Errol Barnett. And I'm Lana Zach. Here's a quick look at some of the top stories we're following right now. Both past and present U.S. Treasury secretaries are urging Congress to raise the nation's debt ceiling before reaching its cap on Thursday. House Republicans want spending cuts in exchange for raising the limit, but the president says there will be no negotiations. President Biden also hosted the Dutch Prime Minister at the White House today. The two discussed several key issues, including export restrictions aimed at China and Russia's war on Ukraine. And cleanup is underway in California, where the worst of severe flooding from torrential rain is now receding. However, scientists say the threat of flooding from groundwater runoff will remain high for months. The Los Angeles Police Department is facing scrutiny right now over a teacher's death after being tased by officers. Earlier on the stream, Kenan Anderson's cousin and the co-founder of Black Lives Matter, Patrice Cullors, talked about the incident. Thank you so much for joining us, Patrice. Thank you for having me. Sorry it's under these conditions, but mm -hmm. tell us about your cousin Kenan, who he was, what his passions were, what his aspirations were. What do you want people to know about him? Um, thank you for asking. My cousin was a school teacher. He was an English school teacher um, at the Digital Pioneers Academy in DC before he was um, brutally killed by LAPD. He's a father. Uh, he is a beloved family member. He was um, really uh, loved his family and loved his community so much. He would do anything for his students, anything for his family, um, and he'll be Dearly miss, we lost a giant. Um, when I read about your cousin's death, it reminded me of this other case that we've been talking about in Tennessee, which then made me look at how often this sort of thing happens with traffic stops. And it's yes. frequent, more frequent than you would expect. I'm talking about traffic stops where it, it's, it's just a traffic stop. We're not talking about weapons. We're not talking about any of that sort of stuff. Why do you think traffic stops why do you think that there, this, this seems to be sort of a moment where things can go very badly? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, for a number of reasons, I, I think about how Philando Castile was killed at mm -hmm. a traffic stop. Um, my cousin, Keenan Anderson, now killed at a traffic stop. I think there are some real policy fixes that we can establish so that um, black people specifically and their contact with law enforcement doesn't end in a deadly interaction. Uh, we have to uh, reimagine what a traffic stop could look like. Why can't we have unarmed professionals who are mm -hmm. trained in crisis, both physical and mental health crisis, to respond to a non-lethal traffic stop? In this instance, um, there could have been mental health professionals or physical health professionals who showed up to the scene to really establish a container so that my cousin could have went to the hospital much sooner. Um, he was asking for help, he was begging for help, and he didn't receive that. So Patrice, uh, as you are well aware, um, back in 1964, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose uh, birthday we celebrated yesterday, um, wrote in Why We Can't Wait, this is a quote from Dr. King, uh, armies of, of officials are clothed in uniform, invested with authority, armed with the instruments of violence and death, and conditioned to believe that they can intimidate, maim, or kill Negroes with the same recklessness that once motivated the slave owner. That was in 1964. Uh, what does your cousin's death signal about the relationship between police and black, the black community in America today in 2020, in 2023? Well, I spent all of my King Day with other community members and family members trying to figure out how to manifest King's dream. Um, if my if MLK's dream was manifested, my cousin would be alive right now. Um, so many victims and survivors of state violence and police violence would be alive today. I would not be on air with you right now. Uh, we have a long ways to go. And we need elected officials here in Los Angeles County. We launched a petition um, calling on Mayor Bass and city council members to uh, have Chief Moore resign. Um, don't give him another two to three years. He's the chief of police here um, in Los Angeles. We are also asking for the county to reevaluate cops at traffic stops. Uh, I wish 
I was meeting you under different circumstances. I wish I was talking to this audience under different circumstances, uh, but I'm not. And so many Black people deserve to be alive today, and they aren't because of police violence. Um, you already know the sort of painful details of this incident. You know, the LAPD released a statement saying that your cousin was resisting arrest. Um, he, we know that he, as you saw the video, that he was being held by officers. He was tased multiple times. He did not pass away there, was later at the hospital. I want to ask you, what do you make of the LAPD's statement? What do you think should happen with the officers involved? Well, I, I think the one thing that I keep thinking about, because I got to see the video before the public, mm -hmm was how my cousin begged for help. Mm. Uh, the first thing he did was flag down an officer and said, help me. Uh, those cries weren't listened to. Um, the other thing I think about is, uh, why is LAPD releasing toxicology reports when that mm. has nothing to do with my cousin's death? Uh, and number three, um, uh, no human being should die in fear. And I witnessed my cousin in absolute fear uh, no black person wants to face off with law enforcement. It's some of our worst nightmares to die at the hand of the police. And um, my cousin's nightmare and our family's nightmare is now our living, waking truth. Uh, Patrice Collars, thank you for talking with us. This is heartbreaking for any family, but because we know how hard you have been working over the past uh, few, couple of years to bring to light these issues, um, I just I just can't imagine, um, you know, what it was like to, to learn about what happened uh, with your cousin. Thank you. Thank you so much. Electric vehicle popularity is rising worldwide as global sales reached around 10 percent of the market share last year. Wow, that's a jump. Uh, General Motors president Mark Royce joined the stream earlier to preview Chevy's new all electric Corvette. He also discussed the future of EVs. Mark, good to have you. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, and thank you. This is a big day, you know, for Corvette and C8 fans with the introduction of the E-Ray. So, you know, this is an electrified uh, Corvette, which, you know, we've got um, an E all-wheel drive system in the front axle, and then we've got the LT2 power plant um, in, the, in the rear. So, you know, it's a combined horsepower of about 655 and uh, 160 off the front axle and 495 off the rear. So, you know, 70 years ago, this very day, the first Corvette was introduced at the Waldorf uh, in, in, in New York. So um, it's going in a, a big a renovation right now. So we, we decided to put it on, on, on Rockefeller Center ice and, and we did a few uh, uh, closed course expert driver donuts on it just to demonstrate <laughs> the all-wheel drive That's system. Cool. But it was, uh, it was quite cool. So Let, it's a very big day for everybody. Let me ask you a question. You know, Corvette is in sort of a special category of cars, yes. right? It's yes. not just about this is a car with a story with mystique. It's sexy. Uh, we can see that the car is sexy on the outside. We know that the cars are, are fast. At this point, people know that EV cars can be very fast. Mm -hmm. There was a time where you didn't think. But there's something that EV cars don't have, right, that gas cars do. They don't have that purr. We know that Corvettes, <laughs> right? It's kind She's of like such a, a car. No, like, I, I, hey, yeah, you're my right. dad's a mechanic, I know. right? So <laughs> there's a. I, I don't know how you would describe the sound of a Corvette, but I think it's something between sort of a roar and a purr. Yes, it's like a, a purr of a big cat. Yes. Um, and that's some I think, of the I think thing. It's a symphony. I, I think it's a symphony. <laughs> I think that's that's what it is. Right? Is that something you considered when designing this car for those people who are just Corvette? you know, enthusiasts. Mm. Are they going to miss that roar? What does this car sound like? Well, this car, this car is, is, you know, is a, um, a hybridized, a performance hybrid. So what you get, um, like, you know, it has stealth mode where the car can actually, you know, um, operate on electric only, but then over 30, per, if the throttle is applied over 30% or um, the car goes over 45 miles an hour, the rear engine, the LT2 V8 fires. Ah. And so you can get both in this car, which is, you know, <laughs> we did think about this and we were very mindful of that. And so this has the, the best of all worlds. So yeah. it's fast, it's, it's, got the, it's got the sound of a Corvette um, and it's all wheel drive. So it becomes, you know, an all year round vehicle, which is very exciting for um, our customers. Mm.
So uh, let's talk about uh, some of your rivals in this space. Uh, Dodge is coming out with the Challenger E-Muscle, and I agree with Anne-Marie. You don't have to have E in every single thing that's electric, but <laughs> I get it. I get it. I do love the name Stingray. E-Ray, I right. like Stingray. But you got Challenger E-Muscle. You got the electric version of the Porsche 718. Um, how will you compete against other manufacturers who are looking to jump into this space, specifically uh, uh, sports vehicles that are electric? Well, I think, you know, when we designed the first C8, which is the mid-engine car you see behind me, um, that architecture and backbone was designed with quite a few variants in mind. So you're seeing um, the third variant uh, in the C8 story. You know, the first one was the, the base LT2 uh, Corvette, you know, at a great price point um, that, are, you know, most people can, can attain. You see the Z06 that we just introduced here very recently, uh, which is a, a flat plane crank you know, uh, really high RPM gasoline engine. Now you see the E-Ray. And if you look at the tunnel and the architecture, it was designed specifically to carry the batteries for the front E all-wheel drive system. I think the architecture is only in its infancy in terms of what it's gonna deliver in terms of, um, you know, different propulsion, different performance, and different excitement for our customers. So we've got a great um, uh, runway for the Corvette. And, you know, we just keep um, raising the bar here and we're gonna keep doing that. So um, we, we did that when we architected the car and I'm, I just can't wait to, to see, see the excitement um, as people get to drive this car behind me for the first time. So we know that GM is gonna be, as plans to be really aggressive when it comes to electric vehicles. And um, mm -hmm. the hope is, I think, I think we heard from your CEO that the ex expectation is that electric vehicles will be profitable by 2025. Um, but you know, it's not just providing the vehicles at various price points. A lot of the vehicles are really expensive, it, but that's one thing. The other thing is the infrastructure. You need places to mm -hmm. charge it. Right. The batteries, you need the battery, you need access to the batteries being made here in the U.S. Um, batteries that charge faster. Right now, you know, you pro minimum 20 minutes, but you're probably, you could be there for 40 minutes charging your vehicle. I want to ask you, what else needs to be done to see the explosion of EV vehicles that GM is predicting? Yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, and by the way, the industry um, is really driving uh, and partnering with um, various different charging companies to do this and um, the power utility companies. So there's a, there's a, a pretty massive effort. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, you know, GM by itself is um, installing over 40,000 chargers um, at places that are near our dealerships and the municipalities. You know, about 90% of the population lives, be, um, you know, less than 10 miles away from one of our dealerships. So those 4,000 dealers have a pretty good footprint into everybody's lives that buy and use vehicles. So that's the beginning of it. But I would say, you know, on the, on the speed piece of it, you know, we're one of the few companies that decided three years ago to vertically integrate our cell chemistries, our cell packs. Our first cell plan has now come online here um, very recently in Lordstown, Ohio. The second one will be in Spring Hill, Tennessee, and the third one will be in Lansing, Michigan. So as those cell plans come online, the chemistries are developed in-house and backwardly compatible to all of our electric vehicles. You're going to see things like, you know, 70 percent of the battery pack in 15 minutes, you know, really big numbers. In yeah. fact, some of our cars on the road today are 100 miles in about 10 to 15 minutes. So um, these charge times are only going to come down. Uh, and the infrastructure, you know, it's pretty nice when you can uh, charge, you know, either um, in an apartment building or a house or wherever you're, you're living, um, you, can, you can plug in and charge. And a lot of people do that. Over 70% of the customers that own an EV are really just topping it off, you know. And, and if you look at um, those charge times and that kind of duty cycle, uh, the world is changing very, very fast. And the industry and all the companies are driving that with the power um, utility companies. And by the way, they, this is a win-win. You know, people say, oh, the grid can't handle it. That's just not true because if you look at, you know, um, the cars and trucks that are plugged in that are storing energy that may not be taking energy from the grid, those bi-directional charging features of EVs um, that are going onto the road today enable power companies to, to take the peaks and level those off, you know, when there's high air conditioning use or whatever mm. that is. They can use those vehicles to go back and forth 
and use that energy. And the customers will benefit from that um, because they'll charge, you know, in a, in a less expensive time frame and then give that back to the grid. Uh, and, and, you know, it's a lot, a lot less expensive than power companies actually capitalizing new power plants, mm. um, and, and that's a pretty tough deal. So, so that's a, a sort of a picture of that. So, Mark, yeah. real quick before you go in 10 seconds, how much will it cost us? The Corvette. Oh, the Corvette. Uh, this Corvette is um, a thousand dollars less than the Z06, which is Z06 is 105. This is 104, and so All that's right. where it starts. And uh, it's a it's a it's a pretty awesome car to drive. So we'll All see right, the, the driving impressions when it comes. So Very cool. Not, not a half a million dollars, it's not a million dollars, it's, it's right very in the wheelhouse cool. of Corvette, and very, very, a uh, quickest in history, so very exciting. Yeah. Uh, Mark Royce, thanks you so much for spending time with us. Thank you, Anne-Marie and Vladimir, I really appreciate it. Thank thanks you. for your time today. We are going to take a short break. Very good idea. Stay with us, you're streaming CBS News, always on. Well, on Monday, you can start turning in your tax returns. <laughs> Something to look forward to. <laughs> but, um, or in addition, uh, this tax season looks slightly different. You see, this year's April filing deadline is three, di three days later because the 15th is a Saturday, and that Monday is Emancipation Day. And any taxpayers affected by the California storms, you'll have until May 15th to file. But there's more to the story. Joining us now to discuss is Amy Peakey. She's the Associate Managing Editor for CBS News Money Watch. Joining us from Burlington, Vermont. Great place to ski if you can. Um, so tell us, Amy, filing dates aren't the only difference. You recently wrote that refunds may be smaller because of COVID relief. Explain what folks can expect. Yeah, thanks, Errol. Yeah, even the IRS is actually warning taxpayers that they may see smaller refunds this year. Um, and the reason is because we had a lot of pandemic-related tax breaks, rebates, stimulus checks to help people get through the pandemic. Those expired last year. So things like the expanded child tax credit um, are gone. I mean, there's still the child tax credit, but it's just a smaller amount. So given all those big benefits that people saw in the last couple of years that aren't around anymore, taxpayer or tax professionals, even the IRS are saying, you know, don't expect what you got last year. And last year, just to remind people, the average tax refund was $3,200. And that was about 14% higher than normal. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, don't expect that. <laughs> Uh, well, in, along the lines of all this great news that we're sharing with our viewers, <laughs> the IRS is also facing a backlog of returns from last year. How is that going to affect taxpayers this season? Yeah, look, during the pandemic, millions of taxpayers struggled with IRS delays. They had trouble getting through to anyone at the IRS. Only one in 10 calls actually got through to an actual person at the IRS last year. And the IRS has been working on this. Um, they have hired 5,000 new customer service agents to answer phones. They are um, upgrading their equipment. They're trying to get through that backlog. But there are still 10 million returns in the backlog right now. And so, you know, what we're hearing is, Things might be better, but you could still see some delays. You could still get have trouble getting through to the IRS. One thing that tax professionals absolutely recommend is file electronically. Tax, uh, tax returns filed on paper are still hard for the IRS to process. So if you can avoid that, file up electronically to get your refund faster. I mean, it's so clear this system is out. Dated. I mean, the government knows how much you owe. They should send us each a little yeah, document you keep saying there as much. There has to be a better way. There's got to be a better way because um, it's too complicated for even educated folks. Um, how will inflation and increased interest rates impact tax filings as well, Amy? Yeah, so this is actually a bright spot for 2023. Thank the IRS you. <laughs> <laughs> we need that. We need it, right? Uh, yeah, the IRS has made inflation adjustments for many of its provisions for this year due to the high inflation we saw last year. So, for instance, the standard deduction is going up 7% for 2023. So that means if you're um, a married couple filing jointly, your standard deduction is $27,700 for this year, up from $25,900 last year. Tax brackets are also going up about 7%. And what that means, bottom line, to put this in plain English, is that it will shield more of your income from taxes. So yeah. you actually could 
owe less this year, but you probably won't see it until your tax refund in early 2024. So just a heads up, but that is a good, a good a high point that, uh, you know, could pay off down the road. All right. Well, I like that we ended it on a slightly better note. Just Amy. read Amy's articles, everybody. You'll be in much better shape. <laughs> and if you can figure out how to, how to make a better system, we would all appreciate it. Amy Peaky, thanks. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Coming up next for you, it's red and blue. The clock is ticking until the U.S. hits the debt ceiling, but Democrats won't negotiate over spending. Will this tactic work with House Republicans? Plus, how the White House is responding to the GOP's demands to know who had access to classified documents found in Mr. Biden's private home and former office. Red and blue is next. You're streaming CBS News. A generation of kids opens up on CBS Reports. I just want to be like a regular kid. Their world, their struggles, their voices. What 